that. There's this. Huh, New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of us. <laughs> um, wait, so do we use this? Do we use this? Okay. I guess for the room we use this, and the little clips are for C-SPAN. Hello. Oh. Something like that. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wrote in the Times that Jaron is one of the most unusual, or the most unusual person I've ever met, and um, I've met quite a few unusual people including our president, and um, he, I asked him, I said, wouldn't you rather have someone more of a tacky, you know, interview you, and, but what I love about his books, the voice in his books is so alive and vivid and like a child and a savant all at once, and uh, it really draws you into that world, so I feel like you don't have to be an expert to really enjoy it. And um, uh, I've interviewed him at his house a couple times, and he, he is a hoarder, <laughs> as am I. So <laughs> I felt quite at home there. But he hoards much more interesting things. He has every kind, every musical instrument known to man, and every square inch, and you know, a, a Chinese opium bed filled with uh, what is it filled with? Well, instruments. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Mostly, sort of the the really big floor standing wind instruments that I can sort of put up in there. Yeah. Yeah, and um, a beautiful golden harp, and a, uh, and the piano is is the oldest. Well, no, it's 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 the best. It's not the oldest. The best. It's a, it's a, for the are there piano geeks in the audience? It's a 1929 Mason and Hamlin uh, full concert nine foot, um, and it's the best one I've ever. I mean, it's really. Amazing, yeah. So, and an instrument <laughs> called a serpent. The serp, yep. The serp. I actually wrote a piece that used a serpent on a commission. A piece that was uh, premiered at the Met earlier this year. It's a big. It looks like a. It looks like a big snake with holes in it. And you play. It's a. Uh, it was the only uh, bass wind instrument in the Middle Ages. It's really hard to play, but it's kind of wonderful. Yeah, uh, Aaron Serkin once wrote this great line in a play that. Um, Music is what science does on a Saturday night. And, uh, and oftentimes, Jaron starts his talks by playing one of his unusual instruments. And as you see, he brought one. So let's start that way. OK. So um, I don't have a mic stand. So I'm just I'm gonna... Sure. Do you want to just hold it here? Ah, uh, the instrument. Yeah, just hold it there. Okay. <laughs> the human mic stand. I might have to patent you. <laughs> What is that? You don't know what that is? No. <laughs> it's called a can, uh, K-H-A-E-N usually. It's from Laos in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, I, I love it for many reasons. One is it's, um, well, just honestly, it's a good crowd pleaser that I can take and carry on. So it's, like, it's effective as a little thing to take to events. But um, it's also arguably the oldest digital number. So this is uh, 16 similar objects that are either on or off in fixed positions, and it goes back at least 10,000, probably more than 13,000 years. So it's a 16-bit number. This is where it all started. 
And actually, there's a whole lineage that leads to the modern computer directly from this. Do you want to hear about it? Yeah? So these were traded across the Silk Route, and the ancient Greeks and Romans knew them. The Romans made a giant version that was steam-powered called the Hydralis to accompany, me, accompany uh, Gore in the Colosseum. And it was so hard to operate that they had to develop these planks to control the holes. And that evolved into the keyboard and the organ and the piano. And the planks were so big that the, the slave boys who operated them had trouble with them. So they had to do these cross planks to automate cords on it. And that gradually turned into automation mechanisms on both organs and early automated harpsichords. And uh, around Mozart's time, there was a player piano that didn't play the same way each time. It had a little bit of randomness in it. And that notion that you could have a player piano that kind of made up its own mind inspired a guy named Jacquard to try to see if he could make a programmable loom, which then inspired a guy named Babbage to make a programmable calculator, which in the 20th century inspired a guy named Alan Turing to formalize a math for general, general calculation, which we call the computer. Uh, and here we are with uh, throne election. So <laughs> it all started, it all started with this little thing. Yeah. Bad boy, bad. I think it's very, um, it's very good that we have the father of virtual reality at a moment when the whole meaning of reality is up for grabs. Mm. Um, I wanted to start with some personal questions because Jaron was born in New York City and then um, his parents fled the big city when he was one and um, Jaron's life is as colorful as he is, as you might imagine, and, and they were running, but we're not sure from what, and you had a tragedy at a young age, and I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your youth that mm. you write about in the book. Sure, so um, we're Jewish, and for my parents' generation, they were European, um, the story you might imagine applies, does apply. Uh, my mother was a concentration camp uh, survivor. She was uh, captured at 13. Uh, she was from Vienna. Uh, my father's family had been mostly wiped out by pogroms in Ukraine. And uh, they made it here and they had, a, they kind of lived an interesting bohemian life in the 50s in New York. Kind of a cool one. My my dad became the science fact editor for Hugo Gernsback's Golden Age uh, science fiction pulps. So he used to write the science fiction pieces in the back of Amazing and Astounding and Fantastic. And you and said he came up with the rumor about alligators and the well, sewers. Well, he <laughs> said, I don't really know for sure. I mean, this is something he told me when I was a kid. And, and now that I have my own child, I've been trying to watch how frequently I lie to her to try to gauge how often I was lied to on the chance that it's genetic, and I'm not sure. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and so my doubts about some of these stories have increased slightly uh, based on that research. But So my dad was um, a, a kind of a sidekick on one of the early, maybe the earliest uh, call-in radio shows, which was called The Long John Nebel Show. And uh, he, one of the things he liked to do is make fun of uh, weird pseudoscience stuff but initially sort of pretend to be into it, but then expose it. So he, he was involved in a lot of the early science um, flying saucer stuff, and he might have invented the alligators in the New York, New York sewers, but there might actually be alligators in the New York sewers. I mean, I really, I've never gotten to the bottom of this, and I feel like with questions involving New York, no one ever really does, right? Um, so, but he might have. So I was born in 1960, and I think they just had this feeling, based on their experience in Europe, that they wanted to run, to get away. They didn't want me to be around. And by the way, I, this is a different topic, but I have an 11-year-old child now, a daughter, and uh, I, I'm so haunted by this because my mother's family waited too long in Vienna until it was too late, just sure that things couldn't get bad. And so now I wonder to myself, like, how do you tell? Like, how do you know? And I, I don't have the answer. I really don't know. And I'm, I, I don't like that feeling. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, but at any rate, um, we went out. They ran as far as they could to the, what seemed like the most remote place 
but their criteria is it still had to have a good university because you don't live far from a good university. So they ended up at the, the edge where Texas, New Mexico, and the country of Mexico meet near El Paso. But there was a good New Mexico State University next to White Sands Missile Range. It was a really solid technical university. So they settled there at that corner. Um, and there are many other stories, and the book has a lot of stories. I can't possibly tell you the whole tale now, but the short version is uh, my, my mother died in a car accident when I was nine. And But uh, coming, coming home from getting her driver's yeah, license. Yeah, that's right. She'd just gotten her driver's license that morning. And um, I think um, after that, I felt a profound, profound sense of isolation um, and it led me to, to a fascination with just uh, the potential to connect with people. How do you do it? To me, other humans, I mean, just even looking at you now, I could almost remember what it felt like. You know when you go out at night and you look at the stars and they're these they're just right there, you can see them, they're real. But then when you learn a little bit about how the universe is uh, put together, you realize it would, it, they're inaccessible to us. It could take hundreds of thousands of years just to get to that place, it's right there. And we, we can't know, we can't get there, you know? And that's how people felt to me. They were like these orbs, these heads were like these orbs that felt so distant, like stars. And there were bullies in that part of the world. There were serious bullies. Um, uh, when I was in elementary school, oh, I started out in Texas, which was kind of, I mean, in um, Juarez, Mexico. I went across. The border used to be this open border. It was an amazing thing. You just would take a school bus across the river, and you'd be in Mexico, and you could go to school there. Nobody, it wasn't, you know, this whole crazy paranoia about the border just did not exist. It was just a very sweet place. You just went, just went right across. And... Um, uh, but when, at a certain point, we transferred me to the Texas school system, and there, uh, within the, when I was back, um, some of the kids in my school drowned and killed uh, the only Chicano kid in, in class, which is the term that we used to use for people of Mexican descent. And they totally got away with it, even though everybody knew. And it was just terrifying. I mean, it was a terrifying environment to live in. Um, so, yeah. And then after your mother's death, your house burned down. You, yeah, yeah. you lived with your father in tents on a little plot of land he purchased in the New Mexico desert. And then he let you draw up the design of the house you would build together, a geodesic dome. Yes. <laughs> now you're a parent and your daughter, Lily Bell, is the same age as you were then. Would you let her design your house? Okay, so we came up with it. We negotiated a compromise on this question. So did, did you notice in the new part of the house we're building, there's an eye-shaped window? Yeah. That's Little Belle's eye. She, she made an eye. I let her make a window that's the shape of her eye. Oh. So that way she can do part of the house, but it's not like structurally critical. Because <laughs> what I should point out is that my father did let me design a house at 11, and we did build it, and then part of it collapsed. Uh, with him inside about 30 years later. So my advice is not to let an 11-year-old design a house, <laughs> even if they seem precocious. All right. I mean, you might disagree, and we can have a conversation about it, but that's, that's my thought. Uh, you, yeah. write, you write about how you vividly remember discovering Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights for the first time. Yeah. You were hyper-perceptive, hyper-sensitive, and even in your own words, hyper-romantic. How did this later develop into your becoming the father of virtual reality? And do you think that you were drawn to VR as a form of escapism from the many traumas of your childhood? Well, I don't feel like it was escapism. Um, I was, what really struck me about the Garden of Earthly Delights was that here somebody from centuries earlier, a medieval artist had created this thing that didn't represent reality. It was this act of imagination, and yet it still could come across. To me, art was like, if, if, if other people's heads were like distant stars you couldn't get to, art was like this warp drive that somehow transited between the heads, you know? And I just, um, I was just 
I, I sort of thought that some kind of, I had this idea that if somehow you could really see what was inside of other heads, or if they could see what was inside of yours, it would just be so astonishing. And I, serial art, for me, was the first thing that had a feeling of something that did that, um, that opened up people's heads and um, and exposed them. And I, of course, sur surrealism isn't the only genre that does that. And um, I've actually gotten a little bit of flack from people who think the surreal um, genre is kind of tasteless and whatever. So it's it's a funny it's a funny conversation to have. So, it, but but I think art does that. And um, when I was a little older. I got um, I got super excited by early experiments with computer graphics, and uh, the guy who invented computer graphics was uh, Ivan Sutherland, more or less. You can get you can get into the weeds with the history, but that's approximately true. And he also made the first virtual reality-like headset in this in the late '60s. And when there was this journal article, I was in college early in the '70s, and I was like. Uh, 15 or so, I think, and, and there was this journal article that was about some of his work, and I got so excited that I, uh, I ran out and just stopped strangers in the street and was holding up this like math journal, saying, look at this, look at this, we're going to be able to share dreams. And of course, it made no sense to anyone. And, and you have to understand, that was before the internet, so you, there was no way to just contact people you didn't know. That actually wasn't a feasible plan. There wasn't any method for that. So I just like run up to strangers and accost them with these journal articles and uh, yeah I was I was a badly behaved boy I guess yeah speaking of which <laughs> in the late 70s you found your way back to Manhattan and lived in a purple penthouse just behind the Dakota you used to hang out at the ear Inn and became part of an avant-garde music scene spending time with John Cage and Laurie Spiegel and Laurie Anderson you write that at that time, New York City amplified you right back at yourself, a giant parabolic mirror. As you walked down the street, you made eye contact and exchanged subconscious signals with thousands of people, no longer so today. Everyone is looking at their phones. What do you think of New York now? Is New York over? When was the last time you went to the ear in? Uh, I think the ear in is still there. Is it? Yeah, I would think so. Um, I, ha I haven't been there in a while. I should go there. It's right at the end of Spring Street by the Hudson. And yeah. they have great shepherd's pie. Oh, they did back then, too. I believe that. Well, what do I think of Manhattan? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I can say anything brilliant about Manhattan that you wouldn't know more about than me, because you live here, pr probably, since you're here. Um, it strikes me as being less distinct from other places and less flavorful than it used to be. It's, there's so many chain stores and that sort of thing, and um, it seems to have priced out a lot of its own bohemia. Maybe not entirely, but it... it, it, it uh, one thing I'll say, though, is that when I was 17 and I lived here the first time, I used to come to the Strand. And I used to just haunt this place and hang out all over it. And it used... The employees here used to be really strange people. It used to be a, a, an odd scene. It was like something out of an underground comic, wandering around in this place. Um, so I, I really have fond memories of it. And I believe my father had come here before me, too. And tell about when you guys used to have to go up to John and Yoko's apartment to beg for money. Mm. Yeah, well, no, the, the, the Ear magazine, the avant-garde uh, music journal, was funded by them, so they'd have to run up discreetly and, and, and uh, periodically and say, the printer wants to be paid. <laughs> and, yeah, so that was, but that's how things go. I think that sort of thing still goes on today. And there was a patron of the arts, right? A, a rich woman who kind of... Yeah, I bet there's somebody in the audience will know who I'm talking about. There was this... There was a woman um, who had energy like I've never seen before. She was, um, I mean, I'm not sure how, what, her, what her age was, but she, she, she was elderly, I'd say, but she would be out all night running around, and she, she was um, this uh, patron of avant-garde artists and musicians who a, a lot of people you've heard of depended on, and... Um, now, she claimed to have this amazing house made of stainless steel shaped like a spike with her ex-husband's bones hanging in a mobile from the top inside, upstate somewhere. 
It sounded real and true at the time, but it seems like if something like that was really true, I would have heard of it again somewhere. So <laughs> it must be one of those things. I don't know. Uh, but I remember we used to run around, she and I, and people like John Cage, we'd run around in the middle of the night and say, oh, I know this one restaurant is going to put out their unused cheese right about now. And we'd run into this alley and grab this block of cheese. And, and then, and, and like, this, these things are crazy. Like, why, why are we running around and stealing cheese from an alley behind a restaurant at 3 in the morning? I don't know. And then finally she'd wear us out and she'd be off on her own to the next adventure. And I'd say, well, we can't just leave her. Because, you know, in those days, New York City was dangerous. It was, it was actually kind of a scary place. I said, oh, no, nobody keeps up with her. She can take care of herself. She would just go off to whatever the next thing was. Yeah. Um, I love the way uh, Jaron writes about women in this book. Um, he, he goes off on a discourse about the difference between lust and limerence. And, you know, he has a, a lot of insights into uh, men and women. And I love the story of your first marriage, and you ended up in a house with uh, tarantula venom in the fridge. Yes. That, that <laughs> well, yeah, so um, we, there was this house in Berkeley, California, that was kind of an amazing eccentric old mansion built above a spring that burst forth out of the hill. And in it was a group of people who started publishing this new kind of zine initially, and then it turned into a glossy magazine, and it sort of combined psychedelic culture and technology. And uh, the most famous version of it was called Mondo 2000, and it gave the, the psychedelic style to the tech world, which is then reflected in, the, in Wired magazine and other places. And so this group of roommates made this magazine, and the, the woman who is the editor of these magazines, who is known as Queen Moo, collected weird substances and she and we did have this problem that the refrigerator was almost completely filled with her collection of tarantula venoms and uh i don't know why we had tarantula venom but it did become a problem so can we get another fridge can we move the tarantula venom but yes that is correct and when there you got venom. when you got divorced there was some weird incident with um marvin Mit mitchelson does anybody remember him now uh, he was a famous divorce lawyer. I remember he wasn't he Lee Marvin's divorce lawyer or something. Yeah, yeah. But um, wasn't there a fight about virtual sperm? Well, the, he was trying. He he was going to try a new legal theory that um, if you failed to impregnate somebody who felt that it was their last chance to get pregnant, which w wasn't, she wasn't, she was certainly young enough and did have another child, but that you could be sued for failure to impregnate, that you could be s sort of sued for virtual child or something like, it was a really, it's hard to even reconstruct. But um, the interesting thing about it was that um, I, uh, in a way, you know, in retrospect, I almost, he was, um, he was thrown in jail and disbarred during the course of it, so the whole thing went away, but for other things, not, not for a case related to me, for something else, but um, I almost wish it had gone through, because the interesting thing was, in order to do it, they're saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to need your sperm samples, and we're going to need to prove that you could uh, father a child in order to, to proceed with this lawsuit, and it's like, you're going to force me to give you a sperm sample, and I, I realized that feeling of like, the state telling me what to do with my body. And I suddenly thought, right, you know, like men don't ever experience what that feels like. But I, I'm one of the few men who got to experience what that feels like to have the legal system tell you something about your own reproduction, your own body. And I thought, all right, the, I, 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 I mean, it, it kind of, I wish more men could actually experience that directly. I guess that's the, the thing that came out of it for me because I, I do think that sometimes we've been a little too cool and abstract in talking about abortion rights, but fundamentally what it's about is whether the state can come and control somebody's body. And uh, I just, I felt that really keenly. So I put the story in there just because, I don't know, it might help somebody else see like how, what a bad idea that is. Um, you've talked about social media as one giant behavior modification empire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. And so have they, by the way. You've said when <laughs> everyone is getting personalized feeds, empathy becomes impossible. And um, others have said one day Twitter, Facebook, and the like will be seen as a passing, often destructive fad. 
or maybe we'll have President Zuckerberg, who knows? Uh, so what, I guess the question is, what, Marie, what, what did it become as opposed to what you hoped it would become? On the off chance we get a President Zuckerberg, I hope you're saving up your worst venom for columns for that era. <laughs> Do you we'll still have the tarantula venom? <laughs> the tarantula venom, yeah. We'll, you'll need to bring out the tarantula venom. Uh, oh, God. Well, um, yeah, so this is, um, oh my God. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually writing another book about this, but uh, it, it, the really short version is that um, uh, the computer world, the techie community, wanted everything to be free, but we also wanted everybody, we, want, we loved Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, we loved entrepreneurs, we didn't want the government involved. So if you want everything to be free, but you want everything to be business, the only answer is advertising. And so Google, for instance, was born as, a, as an advertising-driven thing. But then the problem is computer algorithms get better and better, computers get faster and faster, devices get cheaper and more plentiful. And so what started out as advertising turns into continuous monitoring and feedback. It turns into behavior modification feedback loops. And it's easy to design those to be addictive. Uh, and, if you, and, and it's easy to, it's easy to hire them out to manipulate people. And, well, Sean Parker admitted this the other day. He did it the day after your piece was published, I should note. Right. Yeah, I think... I, and that's he, like, he said the whole that they knew they were designing something addictive just to <laughs> soak out, you know, get out your precious bodily so, fluids. Yeah, I mean, you know, and... Um, the most tragic thing about it is that since these, um, these schemes require uh, input from people. They only work with the fuel that comes from people using them and adding their own posts and videos and everything. Uh, when people add really positive minded, um, constructive material to social media, it gradually gets routed to terrible purposes for the simple reason that social media has to drive engagement above all else and negative emotions drive engagement better than positive ones. So. Uh, th so a year after some positive social change, you have some backlash that interrupts the arc of history and sets it back because it's the, the backlash is, is more powerful because social media makes it so. So uh, uh, the Arab Spring turned into the reign of terror. Um, uh, women trying to improve their, st their, their status in the gaming world turned into Gamergate, which turned into the alt-right. Black Lives Matter turned into a sort of a bizarre normalizing of, of neo-fascism and and so and then the, and there's no reason for it to stop I mean what I'm worried about is the Me Too movement in a year will then turn into some horrible thing that we don't know the details of but all we can say is that it'll be worse than we expect because structurally that's what happens um, on a happier note yes you, <laughs> you mentioned your next book so can we tell them the cats and dogs theory oh <laughs> Yeah, and Jaron I mean, has like uh, four cats that he yes. really, really loves. It's true. We are a cat household, by which I mean the cats outvote us. Except he's worried that one is a Trump voter. She's been coming around. Well, she's an anti-immigrant voter because she'd been there forever, and then these kittens showed up, and she's like, why are there immigrants? Everything was fine. They're ruining everything. They're eating all the cat food. She was really <laughs> upset about it. So um, Maureen kind of scooped me on this because this was going to be the intro to my next book. And I feel like I have to come up with some other clever thing since it's out of the bag. Or maybe I can just leave it. The cat's out of the bag. The cat is out of the bag. <laughs> so the theory, you might have noticed that cats are especially popular online, cat videos and everything. And so why is that? Well, my theory about it is very simple. We're watching our own independence go away and the cats remind us of what it's like, what the thing we're losing is like. Because cats are... Um, you know, cats, cats weren't domesticated. They domesticated themselves, and they're still partially wild. They can live in the wild. They're still independent. They have this aloofness, and that's what we're losing in ourselves as we use these tools. So we're watching ourselves go away. That's the theory. I love that theory. I hope it's wrong. I don't know. I, um, by the way, one of our cats is named Loof because she is not aloof. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, they're hanging from the ceiling above the antique uh, musical instruments. Yeah, that's true. Um, so you were friends with Timothy Leary and once even had to uh, help break him out of the Esalen Institute. Um, and I, I noticed in the Financial Times the other day, there's this whole big piece about how a new generation of San Francisco's working, San Franciscans working in Silicon Valley believe that uh, LSD makes them more creative, but they're taking it in micro doses, I guess. Right. Um, which is just a funny thing coming full circle to your story about breaking him out. Yeah, I, um, I have no problem with if people want to experiment with LSD microdoses or something, but I, I think there might be a sort of an odd definition of creativity at work in Silicon Valley sometimes, but I'll... Well, they, I, it says they took their cue from Steve Jobs, who said LSD was one of the two or three most important things he did in his life. I'm sure, I'm sure that he felt that deeply, too, because it was really important to him. Um, well, should I tell the Tim Leary story? Yeah. So I had never met Tim, but he'd been, he started speaking in public about virtuality the first time it became um, a big deal in, in public life. And there was a wave of interest in, in virtuality. I, I guess it would have been in the 80s. It was in the news a lot and whatnot. And, um, and so Tim started to say, this is it. This is the new LSD, electronic LSD. This is the next wave. But of course, he never seen it or met anybody in it. So I started kind of um, criticizing him in some places. And, and back then, we didn't have the internet, but we had zines. We had like these little magazines that would be published. So I wrote some pieces saying, you know, there's, it doesn't do anybody any good to try to treat technology as like some outlaw thing. I, I mean, like what, like, I don't, I don't know if it's done any good to treat drugs as, in, in the way that you do. Like, why don't, let's, is there some other way to do this? And so he said, okay, well, we should meet. And I said, great. I, 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 got, a, I got contacted by him. And so he said, okay, we're going to meet. I am, he told me, okay, and I can't do his voice. I wish I could. Um, he had a sort of a gentle American Irish voice. Jaron, uh, um, I'm uh, getting paid to do this workshop up at Esalen. And um, I, 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 I like the money, but I really don't want to do it. So... Um, I'm hiring this guy who's a professional Timothy Leary impersonator, and um, I'm going to give him some of the money, and then uh, then I won't have to do it. But the thing is, I think I have to show up at least at the start because they know me there. You know what I mean? So here's what I want you to do: bring your car, and I want you to smuggle the the this other the, uh, the guy who's going to impersonate me in your trunk. And then you're going to smuggle me out. But they have a guard gate, so you're going to have to keep a really straight face. Do you think you can handle it? And like, this is Esalen. This is like this hippie. This is not East Berlin. This is not the Stasi. This is like, a, this is like guys with beards and tie-dye t-shirts. I mean, it's not like a high security place. But So anyway, we got him out. That's how I met him. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's something weird. So there was recently a story in the Times about the Esalen Institute, which... Um, now is having this huge comeback uh, by these, you know, millionaires and billionaires who have decided that they want to try and find their soul. So they're there drinking kombucha and, you know, finding their soul. And, uh, yeah, it's just... Well, you know, I still, I still know Michael and Dulcie Murphy who um, run Esalen and... And yeah, there's this whole new generation of Silicon Valley people, so it's going to change hands, and it does look like it's moving from the original sort of uh, transpersonal psychology people who started it and, and uh, Eastern mysticism people to this new generation of Silicon Valley people. Who and originally are, it was yeah. more about sex, right? The economists called it a, I don't even know what this means exactly, New Age Bagno Bordello, where people got high and had sex throughout the 60s and 70s before coming home talking about psychobabble and dangling crystals. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I understand that sometimes people feel the call of flattery and go a little overboard there, but no, I, I don't know. What that, I, I feel like that's a little unfair. Um, I, uh, I've been to Esalen a fair amount. And I, I, I never, I, I've never seen it be that way, but I, I don't know. The world is, what? Is it part of Berkeley? 
Esalen is halfway between San Francisco and LA, right on, on these very hard to access cliffs high above the Pacific Ocean and there are natural hot springs there and it's really kind of an astonishing place just as a natural spot. And um, a lot of the early, um, like the, uh, the uh, psychoanalytical movement in the US that started to become diverse and break away from the Freudian orthodoxy kind of had its start and its focus in Esalen and um, there are a lot of actually a lot of interesting things happen there. I mean, I, I kind of feel like I should defend it from that characterization. Yeah. Um, well, one really interesting thing you said to me was that um, there's a certain kind of personality that's emerging from the digital age. And uh, you said, if, if you're a mark of social media, if you're being manipulated by it, one of the ways to tell is if there's a certain kind of personality quality that overtakes you. It's been called the snowflake quality. People criticize liberal college kids who have it. But it's exactly the same thing you see in Trump. It's this kind of highly reactive, thin-skinned, outraged, single-mindedness. I think one way to think of Trump, even though he is a con man and he is an actor and he's a master manipulator and all that, in a sense he's also a victim. I've met him a few times over 30 years and what I see is someone who has moved from kind of a New York character who was in on his own joke to somebody who is completely freaked out and outraged and feeling like he is on the verge of a catastrophe every second. And so my theory about that is that he was ruined by social media. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I do think that's exactly right. Um, the, the, the addiction algorithms in social media, well, I, I guess there's no reason to go into it in great detail, but th th it does create this personality effect and uh, people look like zombies while they're using it and then when they get off it, they have this weird, nervous, um, kind of affronted, um, uh, small-minded quality. Uh, and, and you see it all over the spectrum. It's, not, it, it's true for those liberal college kids who are criticized, it's true for Trump and it's true for all kinds of other people too. It's, um, yeah. Did you ever think you would see a president who is basically running everything on social media? It's such a strange... Uh, God, I'll tell you a story. Do you know who the composer Terry Riley is? He was the founder of the Minimalist School of Music and for a long time we were writing an opera together and it was called Bastard the First and it was a science fiction opera about a president who would run things through um, manipulative computer uh, <laughs> systems and it, we didn't get it exactly right, but it's right and it, it was right enough that it's too depressing to complete the opera. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I start, yeah, I mean, sort of thought of something like that. I mean, um, uh, Silicon Valley designers tend to never foresee the possibility of bad actors and are surprised over and over and over again. Um, so, um, Jaron, another delight of Jaron's book is his footnotes, which can be really hilarious. And in one, you were saying you had a, a friend who dated Donald Trump. Oh yeah, is that in there? <laughs> God, I'm really indiscreet. <laughs> Where's my editor? No, uh, <laughs> why'd you let me leave that in? Well, yeah, I did know somebody. I did know somebody who was dating him for a while. Yeah. And um, you said it was a bad experience. I don't. I don't think she came out of it feeling like. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was like a dignity enhancing experience. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and because we're inundated with this in uh, in my world, uh, I wanted to just ask you about you know, gender inequity and sexual harassment mm. in Silicon Valley. I interviewed, uh, did the first interview with Susan Fowler, who is number two on the recode list today above Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg in terms of power, because she kind of brought Uber to its knees over this stuff. And you, you said something really great, where you said um, uh, that it was, you said there's a kind of emerging new male jerk persona of the digital age, which would be some kind of cross between the Uber guy and the pharma bro, and maybe Milo, 
and Palmer Lucky and maybe Steve Bannon, sort of smug, superior, I've got the levers of power, I know better than you, like a insecurity and a lot of power at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's become a recognizable type. And if, um, if the snowflake persona is what comes from being manipulated by these behavior modification loop empires, this other, I don't, I didn't, did I come up with a name for what that is? This, uh, I guess I can't use curse words on C-SPAN, so uh, this kind of um, uh, ass, ass god or something like that, <laughs> sort of like... Uh, Christmas for asses, you say. Christmas for asses is what I said, yeah. But, I, I mean, there's this, there's this kind of other persona that comes over the people who run these schemes, which also does them no favors and is also horrible. And, and so, the, and, and that's this kind of, yeah, this kind of weird smug insecurity. It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a strange, twisted persona, but we see it again and again in the new kind of male power that comes out of these networks. One thing you seem kind of worried about when I talk to you is, so these guys who got rich writing code to solve banal problems, like how to pay a stranger for stuff online, now contemplate this vertiginous world where they're the creators of a new reality and perhaps a new species. And you've talked about them getting high on their own supply. Yeah. <laughs> Well, back in the 90s when I used to talk about the stuff, I would use this bootlegger uh, uh, vocabulary, which is um, uh, don't drink your own whiskey, which is to say that if you have some sort of hypey story to help sell your stuff, you shouldn't believe it yourself because then you, you confound yourself. Uh, and then um, uh, there was the uh, 10 crack commandments is what the rap was called. That had don't, One of them was don't get high on your own supply. And I thought, oh, actually, that's better. So it's the same thing, but updated. So I started using that. Um, I forget when that was, sometime in the late 90s, I think, when that came out. And um, uh, yeah, you know, I think that is a problem. I think when you're, when Silicon Valley does have this way of um, hyping itself that it then believes, and um, we are not to our own selves true as much as we need to be. So, but I'll tell you, there's a good side to that, though, which is I feel. Um, I'm one of the rare people who's still inside it and has been inside it, and I, I just try to call it as I see it. I try to speak truthfully, and people still talk to me, and I feel like more and more just recently there's been, like when Sean came out and said, oh yeah, we made it deliberately addictive. We use these techniques. Uh, the techniques, by the way, were proven initially in behaviorist experiments and then in the gambling industry. That's where they were tested at large scale. So it's we imported it from the gambling world. But uh, you're starting to see people realize that it's okay to be more honest and that, that we've gotten into trouble and we have to be. And I think we're going to see more of that. I feel, I feel I detect a bit of a shift in Silicon Valley and I think we might start to see some more honesty and some more clarity. So you didn't think we're going to need to, you, you mentioned sometimes we might need to shut down the internet. <laughs> well, a lot of people, you know, that's a question they keep on getting. Do we just need to shut it down and start over? Um, I, you know what I think would fix it, and I, I, I don't have a lot of people agreeing with me on this, but I think I'm right. You know, it's like I really think if we just change the business model of some of the big companies so that they weren't incentivized to bring out the worst emotions and the most addictive designs, then it would it would self correct. And and basically the problem is the advertising, what's called the advertising business model, that morphed into this behavior modification scheme. So if instead of that, we had people um, oh, able to earn money by being really popular Facebook posters. And if people uh, paid a small fee to use Facebook, um, if it was just monetized, it would just create an, alter an alternative to just pure attention seeking. And I think people would rise to the occasion and suddenly there'd be better quality stuff. And it would just, it wouldn't get perfect, but it would get a lot better. And I think Facebook could still be in business. They'd, they'd be fine. Their, their shareholders would do fine. Uh, so I, I think that's the best, I don't know if that's the solution we'll come to, but that's the smoothest and best solution that I know about. Um, be, I mean, this idea of, of having regulators just pound on them I think is tough because hackers can outrun regulators. Um, Jaren gets upset with me when I dwell on this, but I am obsessed with this fight between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg on Twitter and 
you know, trashing each other. I'm just going to ask quickly where Mark, where Elon Musk thinks that killer robots, killer AI is coming to get us. That's why he wants to have uh, interplanetary colonization and the rockets to Mars. And and uh, Mark Zuckerberg keeps saying that Elon Musk is hysterical. And um, then Elon Musk implies that Mark Zuckerberg just wants to you know, soak up more information and get more ads and isn't worried enough about getting the kill switch to the killer robots. So, all right, just quickly. (laughs) Well, in general, if you have a company that makes its money by selling goods or services, it's more likely to be a decent company than if it only makes its money through behavior modification for pay. So intrinsically, what Elon Musk does is going to bring out the better in him and other people than what Zuckerberg does. Um, Zuckerberg's fundamental business is to screw up the world almost explicitly, and Musk's isn't. So my my initial my first round of sympathy has to be with Musk. On the other hand, what Musk is doing saying about AI is is um, in my view incorrect, um, and the reason why is that AI doesn't exist. So here's the way I see it. Um, Oh, God, and this is a whole long story, and it's in the book. It's actually in all my books in some form or another. Um, we make up the story that the machines are intelligences, and it's like it, it suggests that we're godlike because we're creating this new life. Um, uh, and it's, it, I was just thinking, actually, you could also um, spin some kind of womb envy theme around it. It's like these men wishing they could create life. I don't know, but anyway... There's this, there's this whole fantasy about it. And the problem with it is, is that it makes you into a terrible scientist and engineer. If you say, here's this machine I'm making, and this is what it's supposed to accomplish, and then I can measure how well it accomplished it, and then I accept the reality of that measurement, then I can make it better. And th- that's engineering. But if you say, I believe this thing is alive. Isn't it alive? It's an intelligence. Well, that's not well defined. Alan Turing showed us that with the Turing test. It's something that's just subjective. It's based on our judgment. And um, and so you, you no longer can be an engineer. At this point, you're a religious, um, you know, ritual practitioner. You, you, you have no basis for saying, oh, well, why is it alive? I don't know, because I feel it's alive. So now... Uh, everything becomes absurd. User interfaces become worse. People take less responsibility. So now all of a sudden it's sort of okay for some giant corporation, one of the biggest in the world, to be promoting jihadist videos or horrible things or or, um, personal destruction for people because, well, it's all a big AI. It's not us. It's our electronic brain. It was its decision, and we'll we'll talk to it. We'll see if we can get it to do better. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It just. And another thing about it is that behind every claim of AI is a theft. To paraphrase Balzac, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, the the the. Uh, in order to run AI, you need a bunch of data, which is the corpus of data. That's the example set that's used to drive the machine learning algorithm. And those things come from people. Um, the example I always like to use is uh, language translators. So language translators have seen their fortunes plummet, just like um, uh, investigative journalists or recording musicians. Uh, they, they no longer make money from what used to be their daily bread, which is um, translating memos, because now you can get free translations from online services. But for those services to work, we have to go and steal example translations from tens of millions of people every single day because the language changes that fast. And so on the one hand, we're saying, oh, you're no longer needed because our giant electronic brain will replace you, so you're no longer going to be paid. You'll have to go on the public dole on basic income. You're no longer earning your own dignity. But on the other hand, we actually need them. There's no electronic brain. It's just a new channel for their value to be brought to people. And so it's a lie. It's theft. So there's no AI. And every time you say, oh, we should be afraid of the killer AI, you're actually promoting the very myth, which itself is the danger. It's not the tech. It's the myth. So when Elon does that, he's actually making it worse. I I love Elon. (laughs) Um, Okay, so this is from the point of view of a woman. I'm, I just saw Blade Runner and um, I've been watching Westworld and I just, I'm wondering if women are just really screwed in the future because um, 
you know, Ryan Gosling has a, a, an Alexa that can come alive and looks like a Latino Bridget Bardot, and then Harrison Ford is still in love with his gorgeous replicant. And I don't know. I mean, should women be worried about the coming sex robots and, and live Alexas? Or, as Joanna Coles, the former editor of Cosmo, says, will virtual reality be the greatest thing that ever happened to female porn? Huh. We love to talk about porn on C-SPAN. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, this is, this is a, this is a, um, this is a topic with a lot of angles to it, isn't it? Um, the, f the first thing I want to say is that um, before we dig too much into this sort of porn-like approach, it's worth saying that there are other ways that virtual reality and advanced um, media in general could contribute to sex, romance, sensuality that are far more interesting and creative than this, than this model. Uh, in my view that, uh, I mean, remember, if you look at at the history of, of uh, sexuality and art, it actually was kind of more diverse and interesting and peculiar before cinema came along, before we could capture things literally with a camera. And I think what happened is, is uh, the cinematic, the, this way of capturing sex created this new kind of, um, it cemented in place uh, sort of erotic visions that had been more more variable before. Just if you look, just look at art from before, and you'll see this really interesting, and kind of diverse, and and kind of more um, eroticism was more in motion before, in my view. You know, that's not to say it was perfect. I don't think the role of women was was better before cinema because historically it's been sort of worse and worse in general the further back you go, with some exceptions, but. Um, uh, I think cinema kind of made us into sort of literalizers of sexuality in a way that we hadn't been before. And it's possible that we'll remember the cinematic era as sort of an unfortunate and sad and sort of perverse era for sex and, and, and eroticism. I might be wrong about that, but I, I wouldn't, I think it's a possibility. So. In virtuality, there are these other weird things you can try that are kind of powerful, like sharing a body with somebody else to become a unified creature within a virtual world that where you have to coordinate your sensory motor loops in new ways. And that, that must sound terribly abstract and strange, but you'll see, you'll see. It's really cool. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I just want to say that we shouldn't think that this sort of porn way of thinking about how media intersects with sexuality is the only way it can. I think there's a lot more interesting stuff in the future. Um, and then um, I, I will say that uh, tech culture is male dominated and this, this idea that we won't need women anymore has been one of the fantasies in tech culture for a really long time. Um, every tech utopia, I mean, not everyone, but the sort of nerdy ones out of Silicon Valley often include like uh, a paradise for prostitution, Peter Thiel's always talking about that, or um, or sex robots or something like that. So we'll need to deal deal with these these um, people. That Is that like seasteading, where you would yeah. have islands with libertarian? It's sometimes or imagined libertine liber libertarian libertine worlds out on the sea, or sometimes in space or, or whatever, um, and uh, I think it's a bit of a fake. I think in their hearts a lot of the men who imagine this actually would like to have something that's a little more tender than that and they're not they're not just purely um uh consumers of of whatever they think fulfillment is as it can be packaged i, I think i think they're underestimating themselves that, that that's one thing i'll say okay i'm mm -hmm. just gonna ask one more question and okay. then we're gonna open it up for questions so a feature in Politico this summer explored the idea of a robot president, some, some techno... It's, so, it's sounding better and better, isn't it? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's who can't be bought off by lobbyists. Yeah, they won't bring the clueless son-in-law along for the ride and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and you know, the, um, uh, in India, the prime minister was campaigning as a hologram. So wh where are we headed with this stuff in yeah, terms Erdogan of... Yeah, Erdogan has projected himself as a big hologram in Turkey, and um, the Saudis gave citizenship to some AI. Oh, right, to, yeah. a, to a female robot. 
Right, and it's it's <laughs> they don't do it to their own women. Just, right, it's probably allowed robot. to drive too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're allowed to drive now, just barely. No, I mean the 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 female robot is probably allowed to drive, whereas oh. a human female probably wouldn't right. be. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, um, this hope that we can have a, a program that'll solve our problems. Um, is very much a false hope because the programs don't actually do anything. They're just channels between us. That, that's like the illusion I was talking about where we want to pretend we don't need all of those translators who are supplying the raw material that's repurposed to provide so-called automated translations. We want to pretend that there's this electronic brain where there isn't. It's just us talking to ourselves through new channels. And so there's, there can be no such thing as an electronic president. That president would just be a channeling of some number of people's data um, I mean, democracy is in a sense that it's an algorithmic leadership scheme. I mean, that's what that's what um, the ideal of democracy is, um, if you if you want to think of it that way. And um, I hope democracy is still possible. <laughs> well, on that cheery note, do you guys have any questions? Um, I have a question about uh, using virtual reality for health. I know that there have been some studies in veterans' hospitals using virtual reality to manage pain. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it could sort of be keyed into assisting people rather than demolishing them. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, um, virtual reality at, in medicine has been very well established for decades and in fact um, my proudest time in the early the first phase of virtuality in the 80s was co-creating the first surgical simulator at Stanford with Dr. Joe Rosen and um, probably um, the most pleasant outcome of that personally is that uh, in the last couple of years my wife's been battling cancer and successfully but uh, one of her most difficult procedures was performed by somebody who trained with somebody who trained with Joe my old partner in building the simulator and the procedure she underwent was designed in a in a virtual reality surgical simulator and he trained for it in virtual reality and it was successful so it came around to us and so um, that sort of thing is very commonplace and has been and every vehicle that you use was prototyped in VR at this point and um, I mean there's a whole industrial life of it in which it has done very good things and then there are a large variety of medical applications that have been tested including um, a lot of psychiatric ones uh, uh, PTSD phobia treatment and that sort of thing I was initially skeptical because I thought they sounded too trendy but then they sort of have really worked out in clinical trials and The question is, um, could you use virtual reality for behavior modification in prison systems? Possibly. Um, a friend of mine named Walter Greenleaf, who studies this, has tried to use virtual reality simulators to help um, gang members learn uh, skills to avoid uh, conflict. And uh, he's had pretty good results and some replication. So I don't, I don't think there's such a thing as a panacea in this area, but I think that these can be helpful tools. Hey, Jaron, it's Nayland. Um, okay. uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what are some possibilities for cultivating spaces um, that are not susceptible to the sort of digital pacing? Like how, do, like how do we go back to the kinds of places of sort of serendipity and mild danger and, and excursion that are outside of these kind of behavior loops? Well. I think there's an easy answer to that, which is just provide people with some alternative um, motivation other than the pure seeking of attention. So if the only thing you can get out of a system is seeking attention, then you'll turn into a kid who's acting out again, and then everything turns bad. Um, some examples of systems that, that offer alternatives. Um, if you look at the various social networks and you say which are the ones that don't have a bunch of malicious fake information, don't have um, mob-like um, ganging up on people, don't have bullies, there are always ones where there's something else to do other than seek attention. Like on LinkedIn, people are worried about their career, so they have something else to think about. Um, we did a virtual world some years ago called Second Life, some people might remember, and there was an economy in it, and it, it had bullies, it had what they were called griefers back then, but not as many. And, and you know, you just give somebody some alternative, create some 
broadening in diversity in incentives that are available, and I think people will rise to the occasion. Oh, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you think happened to your uh, telepresence as a technology? I believe you did some work on that in the past, and then it never really seemed to emerge as much as some of the other things that you have worked on. <laughs> well, you know, in the new book, in Dawn of the New Everything, it alternates between uh, story chapters and technical chapters. And one of the technical chapters actually includes a section on this. And so the problem is that we never solved the duplex problem, which is that um, in order to see someone else three-dimensionally in telepresence, it, you need some kind of a display that can do that, and very typically those might be in the form of a headset, but then they see you with a headset. And so if you try to make software erase the headset or something, it never quite works right because of what's called the uncanny valley and the eyes look wrong. So we've never figured out a, a two-way scheme that completely solves that problem. There's lots of sort of almost ways, but that's where it's hung up right now. Hi, Jaron. Is there anything in the music you're working on now or any music that can help our tattered social fabric or even our personal conditions, especially with what you're working on in music? Well, music helps my tattered condition anyway. I like it. I, um, I'm not willing to give up my starry-eyed idealism about the power of art. Um, I do think that in the present environment, um, since even the best things online are channeled in ways to create negativity because that, that's the maximum engagement factor. It's very, and, and, and this, these sort of social networks have taken over music distribution. It's very, very hard to do it in a positive way. So I stopped distributing my music a while ago. I just feel, I, I think there's no way available that, fi that feels positive to me to do it. So I just don't do it anymore. Hi. So uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering where does or where does or where could religion fit into the conceptions you've created? So for example, as a ch child of Holocaust survivors, I was wondering if you ever read the Mouse comic series or something else related to that, uh, t to what happened and what your response was. As a technologist, um, have you had any connection to Israel and, and the technology stuff that goes on there? And you just mentioned music, so I was wondering uh, if you had any connection or had checked out Klezmer, which has often been called Jewish jazz. So I view those as four questions that are almost totally unrelated. <laughs> Although they all have some Jewish connection. Um, uh, so let's see, let me, I'll try to run through them in reverse order. Um, Klezmer, sure, hell yes. Um, hand me a clarinet. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you something. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely, uh, Klezmer, love, love Klezmer. And, and I mean, Klezmer is a whole universe in itself with a lot of different things that you can call Klezmer. And um, yeah, it's great. And then uh, uh, Israel, I've actually never been to Israel, but we have a zillion Israelis and Israeli companies in the tech circle now. So I see Israelis all the time. Um, and uh, I, I should say that the techie part of Israel tends to be more aligned with the part of Israel that hasn't been in power in Israel in a long time. There's sort of two Israels in the same way there's two Americas, so far as I can tell, not, not having been there. Um, and then, uh, let's see, then you asked about uh, Holocaust literature, and you asked about Mouse in particular. Uh, I have read Mouse. I've read a lot of other things, of course. Um, Lately, I think everybody's reading Hannah Arendt for obvious reasons. And, um, uh, but, and you asked about religion. And so here, I mean, it depends what you think religion is. I mean, um, I, uh, I would say the first hypertext was Talmud, for instance. It's very, that's an interesting thing. Uh, for the, the Goyim, you won't know what I'm talking about. That's OK. But, <laughs> uh, for, um, but the thing about virtuality that does interest me is that there's this way in which um, you can, I sometimes call it a soul noticing device. Because with other, with other forms of other designs for digital technology, you're sort of interacting uh, 
with the device and, and designers typically tell you to talk to it as if it's a person. So you talk to your phone or you talk to the speaker thing on your counter or to your car or something. And if it's like, if it's kind of like a person, then you're kind of like a machine and this kind of equivalence comes about and people demote themselves and they think, well, okay, then I'm a part of the big machine of Facebook. I guess it all makes sense. But um, with virtual reality, it's a different story. Like um, you can keep somebody's Facebook page going uh, after they're dead, but a virtual reality experience doesn't make sense once the person's dead because it's live, interactive, moment to moment. It's like when you're in virtual reality, you can change your body, you can change the world, you can change everything, but there's still something floating there no matter what changes. And that's you, that's your experience, it's your consciousness. And it's very easy to just go through the day without noticing that experience is a real thing. Um, our tech culture asks us to forget that it's real because if we think experience is a real thing, then it cuts a chink in this idea that we understand everything already. You know, because the tech mindset is that reality is understood, we're just filling in details and doing better technology. But if experience is there, then there's this, it totally upsets everything because then it's a whole other dimension of reality. And it is there, you know, I think you do experience. There's some you that's floating there. You could call it experience, you could call it a soul. And when you experience virtual reality, you experience that thing floating, separated for once so you can notice it. So we have time for two more questions. Maureen, did you want to say something? Or? Uh, I was just going to, isn't there some Silicon Valley guy who is doing, um, looking for the AI Godhead now? Oh, God, yeah, there's always stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jaron, I love your, love your mind, a beautiful mind. Uh, since there are at least four big elephants in the room, um, if you read the Masha Gessen article in Harper's The Reichstag Fire next time, we know that we're really any week now on the verge of losing democracy altogether. We know that unless we keep fossil fuels in the ground in the next two or three years, the planet's probably going to, be, we're going to go over the cliff. Wealth inequality, grotesque wealth inequality, it's all hastening us toward oblivion. Uh, well, you're just a bundle of cheer. Yeah, no, so here's the good news. Here's the good news. I, I'm a tech activist. I'm developing an app. And uh, it's really, it's root, root is really what Kurt Vonnegut once said, which is in the battle between the forces of good and evil, greed and compassion, only one thing has made the difference, organizing. So we're trying to play with a new concept, and I want to know what you think about this called crowd acting as opposed to crowdfunding. Are you familiar with the concept? Um, if, if not, I can explain it in one or two sentences. Well, you know what? I, I have to ask you not to make a pitch using question time because I don't think no, it's, it's fair to It's not a pitch. People. I just want to know what you think of the concept of how we can um, get millions of people to be willing to get arrested or willing to do mass civil resistance uh, by using crowd acting. So far, every time people have used online platforms to organize for positive social change, it's been channeled into negative social change of a vastly greater magnitude than the initial attempt. So. In principle, it can work, but it has to be done completely outside of any existing channels. You can't, if you Thanks. use social media at all, you're doomed. I, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but it's just over and over again, it happens. Uh, I was wondering if there's any emerging, like, mythical or um, philosophical cultures within technologists that are making you more optimistic for the future? If a lot of it is based around myth, are you seeing new myth-making that is... <laughs> a bit more happy? Well, I, I, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, in a lot of ways, the history of computer science is a battle between mythologies because um, computers are such an abstract thing. You, you have to have some way to think about what the bits are. Uh, I mean, this is something that might not be obvious to see, but like if you took a computer, like you uh, took a uh, I don't know, a Macintosh or something, and you stick it in an alien world, it would just be a space, it would be like a lava lamp or something. It would be these patterns changing, but it wouldn't mean anything because the meaning's lost. Um, and so the, the, the bits only mean anything according to our interpretation, and we have to remember the interpretation from when we started the process to when we uh, look at the bits again, right? That makes sense, right? And so, um, therefore, computer science only has any action to it if it's tied to some cultural uh, framework. And so, and so therefore, myth making, it's very strange. It's a technical field that can only exist in concordance with a myth making process. And so, um, uh, and there have been these 
battle royales about what myth uh, should be in place for computers from the very beginning. Um, Alan Turing invented the artificial intelligence idea that we're actually making new pe people. That was one of the first myths. But he did it in the weeks before he committed suicide while undergoing uh, really horrific torture over his sexual identity. Um, and I think, I think the artificial intelligence myth is in its own way escapist. It's a way about escaping, the, it's about creating some sort of a pristine human condition that escapes the messiness of sexuality and the ambiguities of, of being a person. Um, it's other things too, I think. I mean, I, I don't want to I don't want to cheapen or simplify what Turing was thinking because we can't really know what he was thinking. He didn't tell us enough, but we know a little bit. Um, and um, uh, shortly after that, Norbert Wiener, who I talk about in the book, came up with a completely, he wanted to come up with an alternative idea because the AI idea seemed kind of hopeless and creepy to him. And he came up, came up with the idea of cybernetics that, um, uh, cyber comes from uh, Greek for navigation, that computers would constantly be connected to the world like thermostats, constantly making adjustments with algorithms. And he warned that if that was applied to people, it could become an evil manipulation uh, empire. He wrote a book in 1950 called The Human Use of Human Beings, where he warned that hypothetically someday could somebody could make a global computing facility with wireless connections to devices that would be on every person constantly and could make society absurd but of course that's not feasible but he it was just like his bold thought experiment um, and uh, and and so in a sense the whole idea of virtual reality is another one of these myths if you like I sort of made up yet another myth and I sometimes in the book I propose that AI and virtual reality are kind of um, um, opposites. Um, and uh, they're opposites in the following way. Um, in virtual reality, it's always people behind the bits. There's no angels or aliens who are making anything happen. It's all action from people that's reflected through bits. But in virtual reality, you change the spatial aspect of a person. You might turn into an octopus. You might be in Mars. So there's this, there's this uh, spatial transfer. In AI, we steal the example sets from real translators and then present them back to you as if it was an electronic brain. So the, uh, the transfer is in time instead of space. So that you, you can think of AI and VR as being orthogonal illusions. Can you see that? Um, another difference, so what's the difference between a charlatan and a magician? A magician announces the trick. And in a, sen in a sense, uh, virtual reality is when you announce the trick and AI is when you don't. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you're gonna. Um, we have copies of Marine's book too in the back, and you're gonna stick around and sign copies for us. I am, I guess. Maureen, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Out. Look forward to the future. <laughs>